Welcome back everybody, this is When the Dutch Went to Space, episode number 6 already, and uh, the year is still 1959, we got some exciting stuff coming to you today. And the first up is going to be a rocket launch of the NL-2B, and you've not seen this one before, but you've seen the two, and basically these are three of them strapped together. Uh, it's the 13th of August. satellites number A and B which is the primary and the backup and I, I do realize that's not how backups work but uh, we discovered that we can actually launch 1.5 tons to low Earth orbit which means I don't need to split them over to separate launch vehicles so ANS was the first astronomical Dutch satellite or astronomical Netherlands satellite it was launched in 1974 and it was actually the first free axis stabilized platform using magnetic reaction control system basically magnets to direct your telescopes in a certain direction it performed twice as accurate as expected allowing the satellite to direct itself within 30 arc seconds rather than an arc minute and the university of groningen where i was born still has a test version in its museum the telescopes are Röntgen and Ultraviolet, and they work for three years. They even discovered the first flashes in the Röntgen image of stars. Developed by Fokker, just like the airplanes. And Philips, you may know that brand. I, the, first, the coupler between the two units actually pushed the first satellite back down out of its orbit, meaning it gets very little uh, data. And we're currently trying to make the most of it, gathering all the data. And we're telling ourselves this is to test all the reentry systems. And you saw the retro records fire. You need a very, very fast re-entry if you have the early heat shields. Because they, they're thermal based, so they, they dissipate the heat rather than they burn off the, uh, the ablator of the shields. Uh, but it went well and we got the data back and now we're focusing on the second satellite, which is doing very well, gathering lots of data. Well, not as much science as I expected, but it's completing the contract. Yeah, so in real life, this was, of course, the Corona program by the US, which plays out sort of in the same time frame as we are doing, like 1959, 1960s. They started using satellites to photograph the Soviet Union. That was because their U-2 spy planes were apparently within reach of Soviet interceptors, uh, causing quite the international scandal when one of them was actually shot down. I, um, so the idea is that you photograph space and then return the film through a, a, a capsule. And um, we're doing this, of course, for science. Uh, we have no need to spy on our allies nor on the Soviet Union. Um, we're just looking at vegetation and stuff that's on the ground, probably dikes and, and stuff like that. Um, or the, uh, the 15th split off of the Protestant church. Anyway, we um, see the satellite heading back. You briefly saw the kind of interstitch that I built that allows the satellite to be directed and then spin stabilized. But I do eject off every bit of mass that I have before re-entering. So we actually uh, re-enter with just the pro core which has the film, add a parachute and a heat shield. And it needs to be positioned very precisely. It, it allows us to burn through the atmosphere relatively quickly and rescue the film. And, and that actually brings us to uh, the 30th of August. And we're launching NAVSAT-1 on top of an NNL-2. And the idea behind NAVSAT-1 is a test satellite for the nautical navigation constellation. So there's a contract I picked up and we're going to launch quite a few of them of the episode but this is of course a test satellite we can launch it on a simpler launch vehicle being the, uh, the NL2 and it's uh, it's going to orbit in a slightly eccentric plane and we're uh, we're doing this to set up a navigation network and this is similar to the transit network that the US created in I think it's the 60s and it was into use until 1991 until it was replaced by GPS. You can see the beautiful model that the people at RO made for the satellite bus and I love it. It's, uh, 
it's it's so beautiful. Unfortunately, we can't use it for anything else than these navigation contracts. Otherwise, I would have used it more often. So the idea is, as you bounce signals off satellites, there is a shift in the Doppler spectrum. If a satellite moves away from you, it will, it will slow down. If it comes toward you, it will speed up, much like an ambulance passing you in the street. And if you use that Doppler shift and you know where the satellite is, you can actually figure out where you are in relation to that satellite. Well, if you have more than one satellite. And the transit system used to work like that. It allows you to get a precision within sub-meter accuracy, but you only get a fix every hour or so. So we need a bunch of them and we're launching them in, in 1959, if you want to be very exact, 21st of December, the 1st of February 1960, and the 4th of March in 1960, NASA 2, 3, and 4 are going to orbit. And, well, not to bore you with all the different uh, minutes or, or well, it's not hours, but probably minutes and minutes of footage, I squeeze them together and you can watch all three of them in awe. And some of them have awesome sunsets and sunrise. And I also tried to pick different camera angles to show how the boosters are separated. You may notice that the core stage is a little bit longer. This is due to an upgrade of the engine, which makes it slightly more expensive. But I think it was worth it. And for some reason, MacJab doesn't like it if you make all the boosters of equal length. This was supposed to be the most effective solution, pushing as little mass as necessary to orbit while overcoming this uh, initial thick part of the atmosphere. So the US is working on the transit program to help launch their nuclear missiles, but we have no need for this. Being a ship-faring nation, a nation of um, merchants and merchant fleets, it made more sense to create a navigational system for the nautical space. And that's exactly what we're doing. We can do this with three satellites in inclined orbit and um, they're in an inclined orbit but they're in a circular 2700 meter orbit and you can reach that easily, well not easily, with the, with the NL2B, about about 3 to 400 meters per second left each to find its orbit. And uh, this is actually a great setup for some of the other contracts that are coming. So circular orbits, about 3 million kilometers. And you can see the satellites are separating and then being transferred to the customer, meaning I have no control over them. I cannot use them as communication relays. And I would really love to, but unfortunately that's not possible in this version of RP-1. Second set of missions is of course the IRIS project, because that's still running. You saw it in the last episode. We were hunting for this, this magical magical kind of radiation magnetic fields that we had discovered and we wanted to prove this Sharienko radiation principle so we're launching three satellites and we're putting these into highly elliptical orbits well, just look at that sunset it's amazing i love the scatterer configs and i should get a volumetric clouds configs but i haven't gotten really around to it getting your rp1 installed up to date is, is quite a hassle. So um, I'll get to that. If anybody knows how to do it properly, drop me a link and I'll take care of that. But the IRIS program is going into eccentric orbit. So the satellites head out quite, quite far, almost as far as the moon is, is heading out. So quite the distance. And they spend lots of time in high space, gathering magnetic data, gathering uh, science data on radiation and then screaming back down to Earth at somewhere between 300 and 400 kilometers periapsis and they, uh, or perigee, and they'll fly to it. This is the moment where they can transmit that data. And I've set up Kerbalism in this way that as they get closer to the planet, they will uh, start sending the data and stop the experiments. And as they lose signal, they will actually start collecting more data. I see I've left the some screens in there, you can see MacJab making his way to orbit. I've, I'm perfectly capable of reaching orbit myself. It does allow me to make these beautiful shots. And, uh, and to be honest, MacJab is way better than I am. So uh, you can see all these Iris satellites in all of their beauty. Magnetic booms, 
radiation filters in place and capturing tons and tons of data. There is another network coming up because we haven't talked about communication satellites, which is the next set of satellites that we're going to put up. But for that you have to wait until the next episode.